Well, thank you all for joining us for our second neuromuscular fellowship uh, meeting. And I think I'm going to just say hello. And I'm the executive director of AANEM, Sherilyn Adkins, and we're excited to host the neuromuscular poda portal and the neuromuscular uh, fellowship fair. So I'm then now going to turn it over to Sandy to give you some housekeeping notes. Okay, Val, again, thank you as well for me joining us. I know I've been sending out lots of emails, so I appreciate your patience through all of this. Um, just wanted to touch base and just make sure um, that we all have our names posted. So if there's any questions, we know who we're talking to. Um, if we um, can stay on mute unless we're speaking so that we don't have any background noise, that would be great. Um, we're going to go through all of the presentations first, so uh, there'll be the four presentations, so they'll just follow in order, and then when those are all done, we will go into a question and answer session. So anybody who has questions, either make note or utilize the chat, and at the end, we will go through that chat and answer those questions. So I think we are good. Um, Andy has any questions for me? Otherwise, we will go ahead and get started. Okay, I think we are good. So, Loma Linda University, Dr. Rosenfeld, you want to take it over? Sure. Let me just try to share my screen here and see if you can uh, see the slides. Can you see the slide? Is it there? It is coming. Yes, we can see it. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. I also want to really thank the AANEM because this is a opportunity that we have not had in the past to share uh, the program ideas with so many at one time. So thank you all very much for putting this together, Sandy, uh, Sherlyn, and, um, and thanks all for tuning in. So I know we only have a short amount of time for each program and so I, I spent um, a fair amount of time trying to decide what I could tell you in 10 minutes that would uh, possibly make an impact on you. So I thought what I would do is very briefly, uh, two or three minutes each, give you a little overview of our fellowship here, give you an idea of what a sample schedule would be like, say a few words about our clinic and our hospital, and then the rest of the time about where we are and, and the lifestyle here in, uh, in the Loma Linda area, which is what they call the Inland Empire of California. I'm not familiar with where you're all from, so some of my comments will be for those maybe initiated not to California which maybe you know what I'm talking about. So the takeaway message uh, that I'd like to leave you with tonight is this is a sort of a unique fellowship. This one may stand out as a bit different than some of the others. Uh, we have a very strong focus on clinical management. In fact, it's a fairly new fellowship here at Loma Linda. It was conceived in about 2018 and approved by the end of that year, uh, recruited in 2019, and we're now uh, graduating the first fellow in the program. What makes this program is so unique is it's called neuromuscular therapeutics. We're really focused on management and treatment ideas. So some fellowships, you know, perhaps have an in-depth uh, neuropathology component or, or um, you know, solely focused on electrophysiology. That, that is all involved here, but that isn't the focus. The other thing that makes this fellowship very different, I think, is it's extremely flexible. Um, flexible with the curriculum and the needs of the fellow that we bring on. And it was designed that way. When we bring on a fellow, we hire them as a faculty member here at Loma Linda. So you function part of the time as a faculty member. So part of the week you're seeing patients independently as if you're an attending, and then you have uh, mentoring uh, the majority of the rest of the week. So what a fellow wants to get out of the fellowship vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you're gonna do next can very well be built in to the fellowship that we have here. There's a lot of opportunity for research, independent research, as well as mentored research, and, um, and the clinical uh, seeing patients and managing patients is really the backbone of the fellowship. So this is a sample schedule, uh, although as, I, as I've been telling you, it's flexible. Uh, this is one that we're currently using right now. On, on Monday, the fellow is actually seeing patients as an attending. Uh, seeing general neurology and neuromuscular patients, but mostly the neuromuscular patients would be ones that they've met in a mentored setting and they're doing follow-up. But they're functioning autonomously 
And, and the reason why we did this is because a, a lot of folks know that's where they're going next. This is sort of a halfway point. You're, you're an attending, but you're not an attending all the week. So you get a little chance to dip your foot in the water as to what it would be like at your next step. Tuesday, um, part of the day on your own, part of the day uh, seeing patients um, with me or one of the other neuromuscular uh, attendings. Um, Wednesday, uh, electrophysiology, if that was of interest to you. Thursday, uh, all day with multidisciplinary clinics uh, in neuromuscular. And then Friday, again, electrophysiology. This is just one split. So essentially in this particular iteration, two days a week, the uh, fellow is acting as an attending, three days a week acting as a fellow, um, flexible. With regard to the didactics that we have, we do have a structured didactics program. The fellow uh, here is, is actually leading a teaching session um, with uh, articles that we're providing on each module. So we have um, five uh, or six modules that we go through in succession and on each module, there's a component on an overview section, on electrophysiology, on current research, on pathology, and we go through them in succession. So this might be what a, what a breakdown would look like. It turns out we spend more than one week on some of these topics, so the week numbers on the left are a little bit approximate, but in the motor neuron section, which is blue at the top, there was an overview, lots of review articles. We talked about SMA and some of the exciting advances in SMA. We talked about electrophysiology on another week. Um, available interventions and management on another uh, several weeks, and then we talked about research. So far this year, we've been through the motor neuron module, we've been through the myopathy module, and we are in the middle of the neuropathy module. Um, and so the fellow sort of learns by teaching, uh, learning by teaching other residents with us online. It's, of course, it's since the pandemic, it's all been virtual, but this is about um, one, to, um, one to two hours per week in the didactics. There's also a case conference that we do virtually that uh, uh, we've enjoyed participation from folks in other institutions as well. And we do that at least once a month, uh, sometimes more frequently. So uh, this is our current hospital building, and I'll show you this by comparison because we're under an, a really an exciting transformation here on campus. They're about to open up a, uh, a brand new hospital, which I'll show you in a subsequent picture. But this hospital, Loma Linda, is uh, situated in what's called the Inland Empire of California. And our catchment area is over 4 million. So we have a huge uh, patient base, um, larger than many of the places that I've been before um, where the catchment area was two to three million. So we're over four million catchment area. There was probably about, I think the last numbers I saw is about, neurology did about 25,000 outpatient visits um, in, um, in the previous year, uh, last year. So it's, it's a very, very busy service, uh, lots of clinical activity. Now our clinic is also a little bit different as is the fellowship. Our clinic is um, a multidisciplinary clinic, especially in neuromuscular disease. And what makes the multidisciplinary clinic here in neuromuscular disease different is we have a full-time allied health team. So we have a full-time physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech pathologist, nutritionist, dietitian, respiratory therapist, uh, counselor. And they're seeing our patients all the time, even in between uh, multidisciplinary clinics because their job is in their house literally in the department. Uh, so this kind of multidisciplinary model, which is probably not foreign uh, to most of you, you're familiar with this. The difference is this is an everyday occurrence in our clinic. Um, even when we're not having organized clinics, multidisciplinary clinics, these folks are there seeing our patients. So it's very easy to interact and it's very uh, gratifying for for uh, the patients to have access to the team members so readily. And one of the goals of the fellowship is actually to learn how to organize this. How do you, if you were gonna go to another institution, for example, how would you um, propose this to the hospital? How did you budget for it? How do you manage it? So running a multidisciplinary team is part of what we hope uh, the fellow comes away with. Um, for this. We have space that's earmarked within the department for occupational therapy, for physical therapy, um, for, for speech and language pathology. We have augmentative communication. So it's a very comprehensive and at least from my experience, a very gratifying way to take care of patients. 
Um, as far as the hospital goes, we are just about this spring, this coming spring in 21, going to open up this hospital on the left. You can see it sort of makes the existing hospital look like a, uh, a much smaller structure than it did before that was built. Uh, this is opening up with about 640 beds, uh, children's hospital and adult hospital together, and it's very exciting. It's also going to open up space in the old hospital, which would even allow us more uh, opportunity for growth. Currently, our clinic building is right across the street from this building, these two buildings, and uh, it's where most of the faculty are practicing outpatient. Now, many of you may not have been to Loma Linda before, so I thought I would just take a moment. Um, Loma Linda is, is right here where the arrow is. I don't know if you can see my arrow moving, but Los Angeles is here, San Diego is here, Loma Linda is inland. So it takes us about an hour to get to Los Angeles, depending upon where you're going and the traffic. It takes about one to one and a half hours to get to San Diego. Very easy day trips. And of course, Orange County and, and uh, the beaches are, are very readily accessible. Uh, this is a blow up of, of a good part of the Inland Empire showing you that Ontario is our closest airport. That's about 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes from the hospital which is here circled in red, and then lots of attractions around. We have Big Bear Lake, there's skiing, there's uh, boating, swimming, skiing, hiking, um, and of course the beaches. There's a, a lot of people try to do this at certain times of the year. You can actually go to the beach in the morning and be skiing in the afternoon if you want to, <laughs> if you pick the right time of the year and both are going on, it's, um, it's possible. Palm Springs is about 20 miles away. So it's a, um, a strategic locale for both having mountain activities up here. This is the San Bernardino Mountains, a lot of recreation there, and then um, uh, the cities nearby. Um, lots of affordable housing nearby. That's a big strength here. Uh, this is, shows a catchment area. This is the hospital in the middle. This blue area is where most people live. I actually live out here in the outskirts of Redlands in a town called Yucaipa. But uh, Redlands is a beautiful place to live, as is uh, parts of Loma Linda as well. Quite an affordable area. I think these are numbers are a little bit high, but this was taken from my website uh, just a few months ago. Uh, our residency director gave this to me. Um, houses for rent in the ballpark of $1,500 to $2,000. And then my experience is apartments are up to $1,500, but many of them are under $1,000. Lots of affordable housing. Loma Linda is a fairly big university, so there's a lot of, of students there as well. Cost of living in the Loma Linda area is uh, a little better than California on average. Uh, certainly, we are uh, blessed with not having the traffic woes that some of the bigger cities have. Uh, but the um, overall cost of living, uh, groceries, healthcare, uh, healthcare is actually less than in the US uh, average overall. And this was taken from a national uh, database called, um, uh, actually I forgot what the name of this database was called, but this is sort of a, a barometer of what uh, lifestyle is like in the Inland Empire versus the remainder part of California. The uh, area towns immediate next to Loma Linda is a town called Redlands, which has a, a great university, a, a, um, a private university called University of Redlands. There's um, nice quaint things. This is a market night down here in the corner. If you can see my cursor moving, this is where they close the streets of Redlands uh, once a week um, for much of the year. Uh, there's like two months where they don't do it now included because of the pandemic, but it's all kinds of uh, crafts and vendors and restaurants. And it's a, it's a great place to go after a Thursday clinic. I, I love it actually. This is a restaurant alley that they decorated with umbrellas all up. Barely a quaint kind of historic, very historic town. Uh, this is a summer concert series uh, that, that's performed for free. Everything is for free um, uh, all summer long. It's a, it's a great activity uh, after work. So lifestyle wise, it's really a nice balance. I've, I very much enjoyed living in the Loma Linda area because of these uh, opportunities. I'm sure you'll hear about the beaches when some of the other programs speak as well that are uh, that are on or nearer to the beach, but it's really quite close. It's an easy day trip. It's uh, 40 to 45 minutes, depending upon which beach you're, uh, you're heading to uh, from uh, Loma Linda. And similarly, in the other direction, you could be in the mountains and uh, lake areas. Uh, lots of hiking because of the San Bernardino National Forest, which is a beautiful area. Uh, this happens to be our residence group that they took on an outdoor kind of adventure, um, outward bound sort of experience before they started residency. And uh, that's why they're all wearing masks. 
lots of hiking right in the backyards. This is called Hilda Crooks uh, State Park, which is in Loma Linda, and a lot of people who enjoy mountain biking and jogging and, and uh, walking there, um, literally a walking distance from the hospital. Um, not to overplay it, but again, there's Joshua Tree is not very far. Uh, Mount uh, San Gregorio is, is close by. This is um, Lake Arrowhead up here. Uh, plenty to do, good skiing and Big Bear as well. So I know that I only have, uh, oh, I'm actually one minute ahead. That's good. So I, I sorry for that very, very quick, um, extensive uh, overview, but uh, I hope that I was able to give you just a little taste of this fellowship. Particularly, I want you to know that it is different in the sense that um, it's how it's a hybrid model. And there's many reasons for that that we can speak about uh, later. I gave you some idea about a sample schedule, uh, the clinic being a, a unique multidisciplinary model, the hospital being brand new and about to open up, and then lifestyle and location in the Inland Empire. So I welcome any of the questions that you'll have later. Of course, I'll stay on uh, for the question and answer period. And please take note of uh, my email if you need to uh, correspond with me directly. Uh, I am the program director for the fellowship as well. So my email is jrosenfeld at llu.edu. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Goyle at University of California, Irvine. Did you sure, I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay, great. Um, so, hi everyone, thank you for joining, and my name is Namita Goyle, I'm the Program Director at UC Irvine. A little bit about me, um, I am a neuromuscular clinician, I've been at Irvine for approximately now um, eight years, and prior to that I was at Mass General for seven or eight years, and one of the main reasons that I came out to Irvine was they had recruited me uh, because they knew I was very interested in education for our fellows. And so I was tasked with revamping our fellowship, which I was happy and proud to do, as well as our clinical trial program offers a very unique opportunity that I'll tell you guys about. So just a little bit about the hospital. Um, we are the only academic center in Orange County. We're a level one trauma center, and it serves a population of about 3.4 million, uh, but similarly has a catchment of approximately 5 million. And so this really allows for us to see a diverse patient population with a variety of ethnic backgrounds and socioeconomic classes, and really makes it amenable to seeing a huge variety of diseases, um, really that I had only read about when I was in Boston. Uh, a little bit about our department. Our chairman is Dr. Hengecliff. She recently started in October. She came from Cornell University. And our department has been ranked uh, one of the top neurology departments by the US News and World Report in 2020. We have about 50 clinician scientists in our department and a really robust clinical and basic science uh, research infrastructure. This is our neuromuscular center. We're about a block from the main hospital and it's a beautiful outpatient building with a parking lot right in front um, that patients tell us find it very convenient to stroll right in Physical therapy and occupational therapy are located right across from us in the same building. And so we've been able to build a great relationship with all of our multidisciplinary team members because of the close proximity. We are a designated muscular dystrophy association clinic and we're also a certified center of excellence. Um, trying to move my... Um, and this is really just an overview of the program. I'm going to go into it a little bit more in detail, but we have been nationally recognized for our work in muscular dystrophy, ALS, but really the whole variety of neuromuscular disorders from muscular dystrophies and myositis to a number of specialty clinics that we have 
uh, with our multidisciplinary team. We have a state-of-the-art electrodiagnostic lab and see a high volume of muscle and nerve histopathology cases. And we really do a number of cutting edge clinical trials. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that. In our program, we have four full-time faculty. Um, Dr. Mozafar is nationally and internationally recognized for his work in neuromuscular diseases, but primarily now has been concentrating on muscle diseases. I um, see, a, again, a variety of neuromuscular conditions and have been carrying the ALS clinical trial portfolio. I also serve on some national research committees for ALS. Dr. Habib uh, is our specialist in myasthenia gravis, and Dr. Korb carries our neuropathy and SMA um, portfolio. And all of us, you can see here, are trained from very prestigious centers from WashU, MGH, Columbia, and University of Chicago. And what I've noticed is really over the years, we've been able to bring our different perspectives from our training backgrounds into how we teach the fellows. And I find that they've really benefited from it. So uh, when I was at Mass General, we had six fellows a year. And since I've been here, now we have two fellows a year. And so in my 15 years, I've trained now almost 50 fellows and have learned every year from how best to educate our fellows. Um, our two current fellows are Jeff Mullen and Shadi Milani, and they've enjoyed our program so much they're on this call, um, but they are looking at hiring on and staying on as faculty next year. And then I just wanted to highlight that we take a lot of pride in the bedside teaching that we do in our center. Um, we not only see just the very routine ALS, neuropathy, CMT cases on a daily basis, but we have this opportunity to see extremely rare neuromuscular cases that we teach our fellows about at the bedside. And Dr. Mozafar and I have given several lectures about different um, muscle and nerve cases that we have seen over the years. Um, our electrodiagnostic lab is a fully equipped lab. Our fellows are very well versed when it comes to both routine and uncommon cases. Um, they can do repetitive nerve stimulation like quite easily given the number of myasthenic patients we see. And then both Dr. Habib and I see um, do single fiber EMG voluntary and stimulated. And so the fellows get hands-on training and many fellows leave the fellowship acquiring those skills. Uh, I used to do open muscle biopsies and we've now transitioned to needle muscle biopsies, but this gives our fellows another opportunity to both see how to do muscle biopsies. We have a microscope in our office and Dr. Mozafar holds an appointment in pathology. And because of this, we have a wonderful relationship with pathology and get to see amazing cases um, in histo, in muscle and nerve pathology. This is our autonomic lab. It's a full autonomic state of the art equipment with a fully functioning tilt table test. And we get re referrals from all across Southern California. Um, our fellows rotate through the autonomic lab on Wednesdays. And um, we have a special interest in muscle imaging. Over the years, we've learned a lot about how muscle imaging can help with diagnosis and management. And so we like to teach our fellows. We actually give lectures about muscle imaging. Um, at national conferences, and we've been recently dappling with muscle ultrasound as well. This is a, an example of the fellow schedule. It looks quite busy, but if you take one of the colors and follow them around, every half day they switch from one session to another. And basically, just an overview is that fellows spend half the time in EMG, half the time in clinics along with a number of specialty clinics from ALS to muscular dystrophy. 
And the fellows get one-to-one -one teaching. So it's one fellow to one attending. And this allows them to get teaching for every case and every uh, EMG patient they see. Additionally, our fellows go to the Children's Hospital, which is down the street three, four miles away. And they spend a full day once a month in the pediatric neuromuscular clinic and fellows have told me they've really enjoyed this opportunity of getting to see these rare cases that they had only read about in textbooks. We have four to five formal didactic sessions a week, um, starting from an interesting neuromuscular case conference that we do. This is our conference table you can see here in our center and the fellows and residents gather around on Tuesdays and we discuss the interesting cases. We have a didactic lecture series that the attending gives, uh, which I'll show you on the next slide. We do an EMG case conference. Once a month, the fellows present journal club. And then every week, we do a formal muscle nerve pathology session. Um, this is our multi-head scope that we usually gather around, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to gather around the scope. So we've continued these sessions over Zoom and they've worked out quite well. We haven't skipped a beat and we've continued all of our didactics. Um, this is a formal lecture series that we actually did at Mass General when I was there. And I brought over the same schedule over here to UC Irvine. And you can see here, all the attendings give these lectures. We start off with electrodiagnostic focused topics, then go into general neuromuscular topics, and then delve into specifics, um, motor neuron disorders, atypical motor neuron disorders, periodic paralysis. And these uh, lecture series occur every other week. Additionally, we take our fellows to three conferences and we pay for hotel and travel. Uh, this gives our fellows a great opportunity to present in the neuromuscular uh, field, to network with um, neuromuscular colleagues. This is um, the AAN, Carol Cruzen, and then these are pictures from our colloquium that we host at UC Irvine at the end of every academic year. It's now nationally recognized as a conference and our fellows love this conference because they're presenting in front of other neuromuscular colleagues. We're a social group. We like to socialize with our fellows and we bring our fellows to dinners, giving them an awesome opportunity to network and find jobs with other neuromuscular colleagues. And then lastly, we have a wonderful neuromuscular coordinator team. Uh, we do a number of cutting edge clinical trials from a stem cell ALS trial. Uh, we're starting a gene therapy trial in Pompeii, a number of drug studies in ALS, myasthenia, myositis, amyloid neuropathy, and these are just a few to name. Um, and then a little bit about Orange UCI's County. Located um, I just wanted to show you what living in Orange County would be like. And San Diego counties. It is a popular destination where people come to vacation, but you have the opportunity to make this the place for you to study, work, live, and play. We are home to some of the nation's most beautiful beaches, and we are only a two-hour drive from the ski resorts and snow-capped mountains. UCI Medical Center is located just four miles from Disneyland, three miles from the Angel Stadium, and two miles from the Honda Center for the Anaheim Ducks play. Thank you very much for exploring UCI School of Medicine in Orange County, California with me. We look forward to having you here as part of the UCI family. So um, in summary, I just want to end by saying that um, I have really enjoyed this program here. I find it a unique blend coming from a large hospital like Mass General where there were 200 neurologists to a center where there's 50 neurologists. It's just large enough but small enough 
to make any changes my fellows have always asked for. Um, both me and Dr. Mozafar have won the faculty award several times, and I've also won the AAN teaching award. Um, and so I hope you consider our program. Our fellows are on the call um, if they wanted to say anything now or at the end of the session. Um, yeah, so I'm Shadi. I'm one of the current fellows. Um, I just like to add, you know, the one of the reasons besides everything that Dr. Goyle had mentioned that I truly love this program is the collegiality that it's truly a family that's very, very supportive. Um, and, you know, you just enjoy going to work. And so, you know, I, I, there's just something to be said about that. Um, so every morning I actually, you know, I, I don't mind getting up and going to work. So I think that's really, really important. Thanks, Shadi. I'm Jeff. I'm one of the fellows too. So I would also emphasize that, you know, not only that aspect, there's many things I love about it, but the cases we see here are really varied. You get the bread and butter cases and you get a lot of the really rare ones, uh, you know, not only in clinic, but also in EMG and in adults and, and in pediatrics. So I, I really like that aspect of it too. Thank you guys. Um, I know we may have gone over, so I'm going to um, end of stop sharing now and I'll be available for Q&A later. Great, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, and so now let's go ahead and jump to um, Dr. Connorsman and then we'll come back around to um, Dr. Jamal. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Shaminder Connorsman. Um, I'm at the University of California, San Diego. And I am joined by my fellow, Dr. Wally Kayumi, who is also on the call. So if you wish to ask him any questions at the end. Um, I did make my presentation very short because I thought I only had 10 minutes to talk. So I'm sorry, I don't have as many fancy pictures as my colleagues. Um, I wanted to start out with the faculty. Um, we have a wonderful faculty and um, I, um, it starts with Dr. Rabbits who recruited me to UCSD. And um, when I was first recruited six years ago, there was no multidisciplinary clinic on the adult side. So I was tasked with not only building the fellowship, but also kind of revamping the, the multidisciplinary clinics and actually giving our patients a home and a, and a place to actually have good care. So once that was put into place, we were able to uh, launch the fellowship and the fellowship is only two years old now, um, but the Neuromuscular Medicine Fellowship um, allowed for the faculty to blossom. And Dr. Ravitz is our in-home world-renowned ALS specialist. He has, um, he studied at both UCSD for his residency, um, has gone to Mass General, has also done NIH level of work, and he is our resident ALS specialist, and he does a lot of translational research. Dr. Batul Gondodu is our, um, was the person that was hired after me, and she was trained at Mayo Clinic. She is a all-around neuromuscular specialist. She also has a certification in neurophysiology, um, and as well as motor neuron disease. She also has special expertise in autonomics, and she is working with the leadership in terms of building an autonomics lab. I am a, a trained neuromuscular specialist. My niche is in muscle disease. I, I focus on mostly the genetic diseases, although I have lots of um, acquired conditions, including dermatomyositis and IBM, um, as well as a multitude of neuropathies. I am the fellowship director. Um, and then our last faculty, core faculty member was Dr. Foray. He is one of our own graduates from the residency program as well as our fellowship program. His niches are neuroimmunology and neurophysiology as it pertains to neuromuscular medicine. Um, he also is part of the ALS faculty as well. So uh, I want to point out that we have a nice diverse group of faculty members um, of, across genders, across different ethnic groups. We bring in different um, exposure and values and Together, I, we actually provide a very rounded um, 
teaching and care for our fellows. And the three main sites that are the neuromuscular uh, uh, fellows actually rotate through is the new Jacobs Medical Center, which is located in La Jolla. La Jolla is northern San Diego. And the older hospital is referred to as Hillcrest Hospital. It actually looks very pretty in this picture. It is very pretty. It's just that it's an old hospital. So it is actually going to get rebuilt and a brand new hospital is going to be um, remade in the next few years. Um, that is further south in an area called Hillcrest. Um, and then finally, the third site that you're going to be rotating through is Rady Children's Hospital. That is kind of in the middle between the two other hospital sites. It is its own standalone children's hospital, and it is a major referral center. And uh, between uh, our catchment area is about 3.3 million patients, and we basically serve a large group of people uh, east of us. As uh, further north and, and, and of course uh, south of us, all the way to the border. As you can probably imagine, um, we do have lots of patients um, who are who have family down in Mexico, but they may they may actually reside in the United States, but they travel back and forth uh, across the border, um, which also makes it a, a very unique group of patients to take care of. Um, I want to emphasize that our fellowship is, uh, is available to both adult and child neurology candidates. And my, the fellowship is specifically designed to train um, a person, no matter what type of neuromuscular specialist they'll be, uh, 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 they'll be in the end, whether it's a child or adult neurology, uh, neuromuscular specialist. So, the emphasis is actually on both because I believe that a the goal of our fellowship is to actually produce a the, the most sustainable and actionable neuromuscular clinician at the end to give you the foundation that you need in order to take off from there. For example, when I was in um, training at UCLA, there was some mention of genetics, but it wasn't it wasn't the mainstay of treatment back then, but I, I was able to get the foundation I needed in order to, to grow from there. So similarly, I give my fellows the foundation that they need in order to be able to take care of patients as the field evolves in the next few decades. The graduates from our, our fellowship are able to survive in an academic or private practice setting. We actually prepare you for both. The, the actual preparation is roughly the same, no matter which setting you end up being in, but I do go over the nuances of billing, even for my fellows who are interested in an academic position. And uh, Dr. Furey, like I mentioned, is one of our own graduates. Uh, who decided to stay on and became faculty. The highlights, um, I do want to emphasize that our program is meant to, meant to produce a wonderful clinician at the end. However, we do have a, a very robust research program and the fellow is more than welcome to um, actually have a concomitant research path occurring at the same time. Um, the, the fellowship, of course, is ACGME certified. And the good thing about our program is that there's a large range of pathology that you're exposed to. You're gonna be uh, exposed to patients by, uh, from all the way from newborn period to 85, 90 and above uh, years of age. There's no age limit for the, for the age of the patient that you're gonna be exposed to. There's a lot of emphasis on genetics as well as therapeutics in our fellowship. And I do emphasize the, the foundations and the core principles of neurology, which is localization and critical thinking, in order to, so that you guys have the tools you need in order to uh, ha be successful in your job. Of course, we have neurodiagnostics, including a, a fully functional EMG lab, both on the pediatric and the adult side, uh, and a nerve and muscle pathology reading sessions and uh, sessions with the pathologist, as well as uh, reading of uh, your patient's cases. And of course, uh, I do emphasize this is both adult and pediatric neuromuscular diseases um, rolled up into one. 
There are several multidisciplinary clinics. There is the ALS multidisciplinary clinic and the two that I was able to ramp up. The PEDS multidisciplinary clinic, previously referred to as an MDA clinic, and the new adult MDA clinic that I was able to build after getting here. Um, of course, there are EMG clinics that are, that are included in your program. And as you advance in your fellowship, uh, you will have increased independence. And basically, the idea is for you to function as a full attending by the end of the fellowship. So you have increased independence and um, uh, responsibility of the patient's care um, that we will encourage you and uh, guide you to take over. <clears throat> Just like my other colleagues, we do also participate in two main uh, symposia, the Carol Cruzen Symposia in Texas, as well as the UC Irvine Colloquium. And we get a chance to meet with our wonderful colleagues and share interesting cases and collaborate and also network. It's a great time to actually see your fellow colleagues and decide if you where you want to uh, put down roots. Um, at the end of our program, you will be board el eligible for neuromuscular medicine as well as the AEA, NEM, EMG certification. Dr. Rabbis is our, like I said, our ALS clinical trial specialist, um, and he does have a translational research, a wet lab that he does work with. I am, um, ha I have quite a few gene therapy trials that will be launching this year. Um, historically, I've had more small molecules and ASO trials, and my fellows are more than welcome to participate in those trials. Um, this is a basic idea of what your, kind of calendar looks like because there are four faculty members and I'm trying to give you some time with each faculty member. That's why this is like basically a month snapshot where certain days you're with me, some of them are multidisciplinary clinics, some of the days you're at the children's hospital, some of the days you're with Dr. Ravis in the ALS clinic or the AL ALS uh, referral clinic and you have a dedicated half day of didactics every, um, every week. And that does include a uh, neuropathology monthly conference. This is an example overview of the didactics series that includes um, everything from bread and butter, carpal tunnel syndrome to ulnar neuropathies. You'll notice that some of the didactics are done by the core faculty. Other didactics are done by the neuromuscular uh, fellow versus the neurophysiology fellow. The, the neuromuscular and neurophysiology fellows are, work together to, to kind of teach each other their comrades and they get to uh, work together. And actually you have a colleague um, that is uh, on a different track, but you have a very similar pathway. You'll notice there's a wide variety of different topics that are covered um, each week. And the idea is to go from most common and, and to get to more and more esoteric conditions at the end. Notice that there are actual dedicated time where I go over gene therapies, how it's done, how a gene therapy is made, how genetic testing is done, how to interpret data. Um, so there's a lot heavy emphasis on genetics in our, in our fellowship. And very basically like PGY-5 salary that is, that's across the board the same for all UCs um, and that is competitive compared to other private practice institutions as well. There is a stipend at UCSD for living expenses. You have excellent healthcare benefits and it's a little bit of a joke because they actually, you guys actually have better healthcare benefits than some of the faculty. Um, your weekends and your holidays are off. I do not bother my, my, my fellows over, over the holidays and weekend. And uh, after work, uh, there is no call. Um, so uh, I leave my fellows alone so that you can have some family time and actually enjoy your fellowship. So that was my basic overview. Um, there, there's a lot of wonderful things I can say about San Diego um, that is very similar to my colleagues' where you have the beach, you have surfing, you have, um, I've gone to Mount Gregorio, I've climbed Mount Whitney in one day. Uh, you have, you can do, there are the sand dunes. There's an amazing variety of things that you can do here on the West Coast. So we are no exception. And um, the most important thing I wanna, I wanna leave you with is that we're a faculty that really cares about the growth and development of our fellow and your ultimate success. 
And with that, I'll let Dr. Wally Kayumi say a word or so. Um, he is halfway through his year of fellowship. Um, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad I came here. Uh, very briefly, Dr. Karsman is an incredible teacher. There are uh, all the attendings, uh, they're very presentable. You have all their numbers there. Any questions, anything you want to ask, they're you know, there to, to be with you and to guide you and to help you grow. So um, I'm just really glad that I'm on the way. But yeah, you have a little access with both adults and pediatric patients. And as we know, there's diseases now that you'll have to take care of them as an adult. I'm, I was trained with adult um, neurology and um, I, I feel much more comfortable taking care of very rare diseases. So overall, very happy. <laughs> So the UCLA Neuromuscular Medicine Fellowship is a one-year ACGME accredited multi-site training program that reflects the diversity of Los Angeles, the most diverse cosmopolitan city on the West Coast and the second most diverse city in the entire country after New York City. The fellowship delivers subspecialty experience in the diagnosis and treatment of patients and neuromuscular diseases through rotations at five sites. Cedars sinai Medical Center, all right, here we go. All of you, UCLA Medical Center, Ronald Reagan, UCLA Medical Center, the Sepulveda VA Medical Center, and then the West LA VA Medical Center. Each site has unique contributions. The multi-ethnic population of the fellowship's expansive catchment area offers an unparalleled spectrum of pathology. Fellows evaluate patients in general neuromuscular clinics, subspecialty multidisciplinary clinics, as well as in EMG labs. Next slide, please. Oh, oh. I, I'm not the slides are that's okay. Apparently. <laughs> running, running a complicated fellowship like ours takes a village. So Jennifer Martinez is our education coordinator. I work closely with her. I also work very closely with the director of our neuromuscular division, Dr. Melissa Spencer, vice chair Charles Flippin, and our director of our education office, Rebecca Bernstein. Next slide, please. So the department chairs of each of our sites are major stakeholders in our fellowship. And the Dean for ACGME, Dr. Kate Perkins, it also helps us navigate all the ACGME protocols so that you graduate on time, especially during this pandemic. It's been quite challenging. Next slide, please. So as you can see, we are very fortunate to have a large, diverse teaching faculty with clinical and research expertise that really covers the breadth and depth of neuromuscular disorders. Our faculty includes world-renowned experts, Dr. Richard Lewis of Lewis Sumner Syndrome, Dr. Steve Cannon, who is a world expert in skeletal muscle channelopathies, Dr. Melissa Spencer, our section head, who is world-renowned also for her research in calcaneopathies, limb girdle muscular diseases. As you can see here, our faculty members actually include former fellows. So we have at least four former fellows, I think if not more, in our, amongst our faculty. We also have teaching faculty outside the Department of Neurology. So we have a pediatric cardiologist who does teaching. We have a neuromuscular neuropathologist as well, and a PMNR physician as well as a geneticist from pediatrics, all of whom give training to our fellows, both in clinic as well as, in, as, well as during didactics. Next slide, please. So at Cedar sinai our fellows participate in general neuromuscular clinics, EMG clinics, the ALS multidisciplinary clinic, which is well known in terms of doing clinical trials in ALS. They participate also in the CMT hereditary neuropathy multidisciplinary clinic. Next slide, please. As well as on the inpatient side. And all of you, our fellows do inpatient neuromuscular medicine, EMG clinics, as well as pediatric and adult MDA clinic. Next slide, please. At Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center, which is a really a quaternary medical center, our fellows do general neuromuscular clinics, EMG clinics. We have a specialty myasthenia gravis clinic, a pediatric MDA clinic, an adult muscular dystrophy clinic, an ALS multidisciplinary clinic, and uh, now we're also developing, developing an amyloid multidisciplinary clinic as well that's going to be joined with the VA. Next slide, please. 
They also do inpatient EMGs and consultations as well. As at West LA VA and Sepulveda VA, our, our fellows participate in general neuromuscular clinics, EMG clinics, our ALS multidisciplinary clinic, and a novel telepolyneuropathy clinic that a colleague and I established a few years a few years ago and now have published. So when you uh, when you come here for fellowship, you'll be involved in these you know, clinical and clinical translational research clinics as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of research that's going on that fellows can be involved in, we have research going on in really all aspects of neuromuscular disease all the muscular dystrophies, ALS, and we're really talking about both you know, basic science research as well as clinical trials. And we're also doing clinical research, looking at data, doing EMG work. Polyneuropathy amyloid has become a major research area, both at the VA and at UCLA. At all of you, Dr. Mishra is doing research in sarcopenia. And, and as you, many of you may know, Dr. Perry Shea is a clinical trialist for so many new drugs that are in development. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so our fellowship structure. So we're a relatively large fellowship. Typically, actually, we have four fellows a year. Ideally, we have two adult fellows, one pediatric fellow, and then one PM&R fellow. So we accept PM&R residents in our fellowship. It's one year with the option of a second year of research for those fellows who are interested. Our schedule is divided into two-week blocks plus two weeks of elective time, two two-week blocks of elective time. So there's a Cedars block, a UCLA block, a West LA VA slash UCLA block, mainly at West LA, and then a mixed block at multiple sites. We have program-wide didactics every Monday morning from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. In addition, every site has didactics weekly. So I won't go into our didactic schedule, but when you come to interview, we'll go over that extensively. Our fellows are doing research presentations at the annual MDA scientific conference, and they also present at the UCI symposium. Through, through ACGME requirements, they do the QI project, they do the self-assessment exams, and at the end of fellowship, our fellows are eligible for the ABPN neuromuscular boards, as well as the ABM initial certification exam. So you know what our fellows do after fellowship. About 50% go into academia and 50% go into private practice. So when you do this fellowship, you have a choice of what you want to do. And our fellows typically, you know, have their choice of job offers. They go where they want to go and we make sure they go where they want to go, both in terms of the type of practice as well as the location. Because once you come to LA, it's really hard to leave the LA area and it's really hard to leave California or the West Coast. Next slide, please. Ah, so because we're in the pandemic, I really wanted to show you that we take care of our fellows. First and foremost, the health and safety of our fellows is number one. It's always on our mind from the beginning. You know, we initially had to switch over our clinics from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual clinics. Now, we've, now we're sort of 50-50. And then after closing the EMG lab, initially we went to a protocol that is very, very safe with plenty of PPE for our trainees. So as you can see here, Alex Yervani and one of our uh, now, now faculty former fellows is completely in the UCLA uh, U Shield. He's wearing a gown, face mask. The rest of us, while we're at the VA, we're wearing the MIT disposable face shields, N95 masks, gloves, gowns. Everyone is safe. So far, no one has gotten COVID. And we make sure that you know, our fellows are really, really safe. That's, that's the number one thing. And as you're going in to fellowship applications and interview season, that's something uh, that I think uh, we want to reassure you about. I think that's it. We look, f yeah, oh, I, one more thing, social events. So unfortunately, there are no social events except virtual ones, but we typically do uh, host a Christmas party, end of year party, graduation. We're very social. We have a lot of alumni from all over. Once conferences reopen, we'll be hosting actually UCLA alumni happy hour events at the conferences AANEM and AAN and MDA. So we hope to see you uh, at, at these if uh, you become one of our fellows. And then we really look forward to reviewing your applications.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jamal. Dr. Rosenfeld, did you want to introduce um, one of your... Um, sure, I, uh, thank you. Am I on? Uh, thank you. I, uh, in the interest of trying to be respectful of, of the time I had, I neglected to introduce uh, Dr. Karthik Bhubaneswaran, who is our uh, fellow currently, who I see is on the call, and um, is uh, as midway, I guess, through uh, through the fellowship, and uh, wanted to give him an opportunity uh, to say anything uh, that you like about uh, the program um, that you're involved in. Hello, everyone. Hey, Dr. Rosenfeld. Uh, thank you for uh, for the introduction. And um, as Dr. Rosenfeld mentioned earlier, um, the program at Loma Linda is definitely very unique. Uh, speaking for myself, uh, when I decided um, as, oh, um, I don't know if Dr. Rosenfeld mentioned this earlier. Um, I was a physiatry trained, um, um, I was physiatry trained coming out and I was going to go into pain fellowship for the longest time and change my mind at the last minute uh, when I found out about neuromuscular medicine. And there weren't a lot of programs that were open to um, PM&R uh, residents uh, applying, and Loma Linda um, was definitely one of my top options at the moment. Um, I did reach out to UCLA, uh, but I was um, uh, a bit behind, uh, behind the eight ball um, at the time. But I was definitely very glad um, that I found Loma Linda and they were uh, willing to take on a uh, PM&R resident and I've definitely enjoyed my time there. Um, the exposure that I get, uh, the faculty that I get to work with, um, um, it's, it's definitely a very close-knit family and everybody's willing to help. Um, going from PM&R into a bread and butter neurology practice, there was definitely a, a transition period, uh, but I could not have done it without the support um, that I had at Loma Linda. Uh, so that's definitely very, very unique. Um, and also the flexibility that Dr. Rosenfeld mentioned, um, that was definitely big. Um, early on, I didn't have, uh, uh, I had a lot of interest in uh, learning the, the therapeutics, uh, the management of the diseases, the diagnosis, and into um, all this unique pathology. Uh, but I developed interest in uh, wanting to do more neurophysiology. Um, I did uh, uh, a number of EMGs um, during the PM&R training, but we didn't get to see a lot of the unique neuromuscular cases. So I developed interest in that and Dr. Roosevelt, it only took him about a week to move the schedule around and uh, make sure that I was able to get exposure uh, both with himself and other neuromuscular attendings. So um, I can um, gain uh, insight into that as well. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> Oh, no, I was just going to say, I'll, be, I'll uh, stick around if uh, anyone has any questions at all going forward. I just want to put a footnote on that, that uh, uh, Dr. Bhuvanas Warren did come from a PM&R background, but he has done so well in the fellowship and, and exceeded in this environment that uh, he is uh, very likely going to stay on as one of our neurology faculty, uh, serving a very unique role in the uh, department. So uh, that is a real strength of a lot of the programs, Loma Linda included, is that it is oftentimes a, a pathway to joining a faculty, as was the case for uh, uh, Dr. Ruminus Warren. So thank you for that opportunity to add that, that I didn't get to do. Yes, you're very welcome. We enjoy hearing from the resident or the fellows so that the residents kind of can hear firsthand um, what their experiences are like. So now we're gonna open it up for question and answer. So um, for you residents out there, if you wanna go ahead and just utilize the chat and send any messages, please indicate who the message is for um, and what your question is. And we will um, be happy to answer those questions. Um, Dr. Rosenfeld, would you like to tell us um, why you think being a neuromuscular physician is the best kind of neuromuscular or best kind of neurology? subspecialty to go into? Well, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, so maybe that's an unfair question, but it, it clearly um, is for me uh, the most gratifying area of neurology. I mean, I think all of us went into neurology for a variety of reasons, uh, different reasons perhaps. Um, in, in my case, I can tell you when I was in training, um, the thing that used to get under my skin more than anything was self-inflicted disease, disease that a person perhaps did to themselves, ate too much, drink too much, smoke too much, don't exercise, and then you get sick. But neurologic disease in general isn't like that, with some exceptions, but largely. And amongst the neurological diseases, 
neuromuscular disease especially takes otherwise often otherwise very healthy unsuspecting folks that didn't really do anything uh, adverse and and they oftentimes get get a very um, considerable disability because of the disease so being able to make a difference in the life of a neuromuscular patient in my experience has made so much of a difference I, I can't even begin to tell you the payback is is a hundred to one for me when you take a um, ALS patient or an unstable myasthenic patient or a person with a muscular dystrophy and you intervene, it's very considerable. So it's for me, it's really uh, kind of self-serving. It's extremely gratifying uh, to treat this patient population. Thank you. Um, well, I think that some of the residents might be deciding between, uh, you know, an epilepsy fellowship or, you know, um, a different kind of neurology fellowship. So that's why I wanted to have you or um, one of your other colleagues talk about why neuromuscular is, is the best. So, um, Nasheed, do you want to say why you think neuromuscular is the best? Sure. So I think neuromuscular medicine is really the best specialty because you get to see the rarest of the rare cases, right? We see cases in neuromuscular that people only read about or don't even hear about. And we get to give them multidisciplinary care, right? Which is really the ideal way of taking care of a patient, right? Multidisciplinary care is most established and developed in neuromuscular medicine. And so I think with these two things combined, it's really a special subspecialty. And in addition, the one that we get to do procedures, right? So. We get to use our hands and get to do EMG procedures, which is really gratifying, especially in terms of localization, right? We're the ones who really perform a thorough neurological exam and precisely localize. So we're really, we're really the black box of neurology when neurology is a black box of the rest of medicine. In my opinion, the neuromuscular specialist is, is the detective uh, within neurology. Like we get to actually think we are very cerebral. We have, just like uh, Nasheed said, we localize, we get right to the point. And most of our cases, we actually get to find out if we're right by doing either an EMG or a gene test. I mean, that is unparalleled in most of medicine. And that's what makes it so exciting. And because it's genetic, I used to think that, oh gosh, it's genetic, it's never going to get treated. And now, because things are genetic, we actually have interventions and technologies that we're use, utilizing right now that has the possibility of changing the lifespan, the outlook of patients, and that has never been conceived of before. Ten years ago, when I was a fellow uh, at UCLA, we weren't even talking about gene therapy, but it was on the brink. And... and um, and that's why I, I told in my presentation that it's so important to give my fellow the tools that they need so they can actually adapt as the field grows. And so this, this, this field is, I think, just on the verge of just absolutely exploding and having so much profound um, implications to a patient at the end. So um, that's why I'm here and that's why I'm actually intentionally there for, for education because I want to impart that joy uh, to my, uh, my, my future fellows. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I, would, I would echo that um, as well. What, um, as whatever my colleagues have said, I would echo that. I think it's one of the rarest specialties that if you just listen to the patient, and do a wonderful neuromuscular exam, uh, a majority of the time you can hone in on the exact diagnosis. And it really just adds to the um, experience of examining a patient quite well, uh, alluding to what I said about the bedside and clinical pearls are really unparalleled from other specialties. And then um, as Dr. Connersman said, we're entering this amazing era of one, genetic testing. Many genetic panels have become free. When even five years ago, panels costed thousands of dollars. And so many patients were not able to get a diagnosis. And I remember once my chairman, former chairman had said, 
well, why do you guys work so hard to get a diagnosis when it doesn't change the management? But well, we've now entered a different era where we are doing gene therapy and we are doing trials and we are doing interventions. And patients want to know the diagnosis, and now we have the ability to give it to them. I think it's one of the most gratifying fields currently. Yeah, we're definitely in exciting times. When I started to be an executive director at AANEM, I never expected that I would see the day where there would be such such amazing um, therapies coming out. So it's it's very exciting. So we have you a know, question. If you, if you look all around throughout the spectrum of neurology and look at what our advances are, we're in an unprecedented time in neurology. But what's happened in the recent past? We now have a, an extraordinary treatment for SMA. I never thought I was going to see that. We have a treatment for Duchenne dystrophy. We have a whole new treatment modality for myasthenia we didn't have before. We have a drug for periodic paralysis. We have um, several disease modifying agents for ALS. These are all came into the fact, all came into the fold within the last several years. Yeah. What other area of neurology has had as many advances in such a concentrated period of time? I don't know why everybody's not a neuromuscular doctor. I really don't. It's just. <laughs> there, you, there you go. So we do have a question um, asking if you guys could address um, what is the volume like on a day-to-day -day basis and do patients see inpatient consults in addition to their outpatient clinic duties? So Jeffrey Rosenfeld, since you're uh, still on non-muted, do you want to answer that for your fellowship? Sure. Um, the volume uh, ranges depending upon what the clinical activity of the day is. In a multidisciplinary clinic, we probably have between... Uh, 10 and 12 patients over the course of a day that we're seeing in a comprehensive way that the filler might be involved in. If it's not a multidisciplinary day, perhaps a few less than that, uh, 8 to 10 over the course of a day. Um, the inpatient and sometimes less depending upon EMG wise, uh, perhaps three to four in a half a day session uh, for them. Uh, inpatients is an option uh, that has not been built into our fellowship yet just because of time constraints. But if that was an interest of a fellow uh, to be involved in inpatient services, that's a very easy, seamless, actually, uh, way to integrate into the program. Yeah, I guess I'll go next. So for us, the volume really varies per site. But in general, I would say during non-COVID times, and hopefully by the time you start our fellowship, we'll be out of the pandemic, uh, you see a one new consult every hour. And then the same thing for an EMG. So in the way we structured our fellowship is that fellows on non-didactics, they start at 8 a.m. and they're really, their last patient should be done by 5 p.m. And any extra time should be spent doing notes. They never do, you know, call, they never do overnight call. They never come on the weekends. Between 5 and 7, if there's an inpatient EMG or consultation that hasn't been done during the day, they might end up doing that. But there's one fellow on like inpatient service um, for every for every site. I think for us, uh, well, you're welcome to chime in. Um, every fellow, I'm so sorry, my baby is crying. Um, um, Thank you. Every, <laughs> every yeah, fellow could. does um, have roughly like 10 um, consults. It is indeed one hour per new person and about 30 to 40 minutes for a return patient. An EMG can be roughly um, one hour. My some EMGs have lasted two hours. I do. I'm very mindful of um, my fellow's workload. If for some reason my fellow is actually uh, falling behind, I do actually step in just so that uh, the patient is not waiting. My fellow is not. Uh, I, I don't want my fellow to burn out. Certainly, and I'm mindful of my fellows' uh, workload as well. So that's true for the vast majority of faculty members, and it's it's not been a problem. And Wally, please speak to uh, what you think is uh, happening at our site. Yeah, in terms of the, workload. The, the workload seems completely fine. It it, it can range uh, from day to day, like from um, certain days, it definitely is more than others. But between like maybe eight to uh, certain days are. Uh, certain Mondays are a little bit more as in like 14, uh, but you have another fellow with you uh, to help you out. Um, and then for EMGs, it can it kind of ranges, but um, maybe six to eight, um, uh, you, you're able to do them with um, 
you know, plenty of time. Um, in terms of inpatient consults, you get about maybe zero to three per month. So it's very doable. And uh, there's always a little bit of time for you to, to be able to go. So um, there's no rush to it. Thankfully with our fellowship, this is not a stroke fellowship. There's no stroke alert. So, you know, you kind of build into whenever you have the time to be able to go and you can, you know, go and see them, but it's very manageable. And then patient consults could be either EMG consults or actual consultations for the patient. And that does include pediatric consultations and EMGs. And uh, I generally like go send Raleigh to go do a consult and or EMG on a patient while I'm finishing up in clinic. And it might be a patient that the clinic patient might not be as, in, as educational as the consult patient typically. So I weigh the, 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 the educational value of the consultation versus the in-person clinic for my fellows, just to make it the best experience for him or my fellow in general. One thing to add, I, they do uh, listen to feedback and I was interested in giving Spinraza and I, I just gave some last week. So it's, uh, it's kind of nice to have that, that feedback and to if whatever you're interested in, they'll, they'll let you dive in and, and do certain things. Similarly at UC Irvine, we are an eight to five fellowship. Um, every half day, the fellows work with a different attending. So we're quite mindful of making sure a fellow's done by 12 so that they can eat and move on to the next clinic at one. Um, and they're done by five. We know the fellows take boards during that year. So I, I find it really important for the fellows to be able to go home at night, no call, study at night. Volume wise, we see the fellows sometimes, depending on you versus follow-ups, but they'll see maybe four to five clinic patients. However, if they're running behind, the attending knows, and all of our attendings do this, but they will take over the case. So we'd rather have a fellow um, really learn from one particular case than running through different cases. Um, and that, none of our fellows ever have felt that the system doesn't work. And if they um, do, we know to change it. I have an open door policy where we love hearing feedback from our fellows. If I can just jump on with um, what Dr. Goyle was saying, um, you know, I, I think our clinic life is very, very balanced. Um, as Dr. Goyle was mentioning, I never feel overwhelmed. Um, if I do feel overwhelmed, attendings always jump in. Um, as far as the inpatient consults go, we do get inpatient consults there. I, not maybe super frequent, it varies from month to month, and we do get inpatient EMGs as well. Um, we're able to really balance it out between the two fellows so that if one fellow, you know, is in clinic and kind of busier, they stay in clinic, the other fellow goes to the hospital and does the EMG, but it, it's worked out pretty well. I'm wondering if you could expand on how much experience the fellow could get in muscular ultrasound. Yeah, um, so we are very interested in muscle nerve imaging. Uh, for the past few years, uh, Dr. Mozafar, me, Dr. Habib, we all do muscle MRI, nerve MRI on our patients. And so uh, just through that, we've learned a lot. I've actually been invited to give lectures both at the AAN and the AANEM this coming spring on um, muscle MRIs. And so we teach our fellows with every case and in our didactic sessions about what um, fellows can glean out of a muscle MRI. But additionally, we've uh, recently been looking into ultrasound and the picture that I had shown in my presentation was just one of those ultrasounds that you can attach to your phone and image uh, nerve and muscle. And actually Dr. Mullen, who's our current fellow, has had some experience and he's going, both for him and Shadi have been interviewing to join on as faculty and we're going to be expanding the nerve ultrasound, muscle ultrasound program. And so for, of, of course, fellows would be getting hands-on training really with every case should they want it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, well, we are gonna wrap this up. Um, again, thank you everybody so much for joining us.
Um, we appreciate all of your time. Um, just as a reminder, um, if you've come up with any other questions for any of the programs, please continue to use the portal. There is a communication section in there. So just go ahead and ask questions to your program and they will be happy to help you. Thanks everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully either at our upcoming March virtual meeting or the live October meeting. God willing, we all can be together in um, Colorado because I miss seeing everybody. And so looking forward to in-person meetings again.